Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. This video is a part of my laboratory success series and we are going to be looking at great graphs. Before we get into it, I'm going to ask for your support. You want to feed the penguin by clicking those buttons below. You know it feels good. Another way you can feed the penguin is by supporting Audible. So if you are interested in downloading a free audiobook of your choice, click the link below. And thanks to Audible for supporting the Penguin Prof channel. So you want to stay tuned. We're going to do a lot of good graphing here. This is going to be a quick overview of the different types of graphs. I want to say at the outset that this is designed for biology, physiology, sort of natural science students. This is not geared for, for example, a statistics class. Um, we are going to look at the essential components of a graph and how to do graphs by hand. Okay, so let's look at the major types of graphs you are going to come into contact with. Um, the first is a pie graph or a pie chart. These are pretty self-explanatory. Generally, what you're going to see in a pie chart is a simple legend which will explain what the colors represent, and that's pretty much it. Next, we've got bar graphs, and bar graphs are used to compare different variables and categories like this one. You notice that the bars can be reordered and they do not touch each other. Um, bar graphs are also useful for looking at things like this, where you have a single variable or a summary variable, like a mean, among different groups over time. Um, and here you can see it's really easy to look at positive and negative changes. This is the GDP for Cuba. And by the way, I have to mention we just got back from a project in Cuba, and it was an absolutely amazing, amazing place. Okay, next we have a frequency histogram. This is used to show a distribution of variable values. So instead of showing different categories, like before we had the different types of trash, this is a single variable, and in this case it's height, and we're looking at the distribution of different heights that were observed in a particular species of pine. And you notice that bars can't be reordered and they touch each other. A scatter plot is used to show correlations between two variables. Usually we're looking to see, is there a relationship between these two variables? And you'll often see a regression line that is shown to express that relationship if there is one. A line graph is something that we're going to be looking at in more detail, and it shows you a relationship between a dependent and an independent variable. We are going to get into that in just a second. In some line graphs, you will be asked to connect the data points, like the one shown here, and sometimes you will be asked to draw a line of best fit, and we're going to be doing that here in just a moment. So we are going to make a line graph by hand. Yes, this is old school, but I do require my students to do this during their lab period. It's just a good skill to have. Item number one, use a ruler and graph paper. Just, just, just do it, okay? The next thing you're going to need is a descriptive title. This should be a phrase that tells the reader, what is this? it should answer that question. So the graph should stand alone. You should be able to look at the graph and with the title and the axes, explain to someone else what the f is being shown here. You can tell by looking at these, there's no way to know what the data actually represents here. Once you have a title, you're going to need a legend if you have multiple data sets. So that basically just shows if you have different lines or different bars, what does each line or each bar represent. Next we have axes. Each axis has a title and it will have units. And so you should be able to read blank measured in blank. So the axis title is what is being measured, and the units in parentheses are the units of measure. So time measured in seconds, mass measured in grams, etc. You need both of those. There are a few exceptions. The most notable is this guy, absorbance. You'll see sometimes it will be written as just a capital A. It is unitless. So if you are measuring absorbance in a spectrophotometer, you don't need units there, but everybody else is going to need units. 
All right, so which axis is which, and what do you plot on each one? The x-axis is where the independent variable goes. That is the thing that changes or the thing you are manipulating. The y-axis is the dependent variable. That is the thing you are measuring. So some examples will probably be helpful here. The relationship between the sales of ice cream and ambient temperature. So as the temperature changes, how many ice cream cones do you sell? The relationship between soil nitrogen, how much nitrogen is in the soil and how tall did the tomato plants get? And as you look at the change in absorbance, you're actually looking at the production of product in a reaction that is catalyzed by the enzyme alkaline phosphatase. So absorbance is what you're measuring, that goes on the Y, and time is on the X. Okay, how to make a graph. The first thing you're going to do is collect the data and determine the best kind of graph to use. So I am going to be graphing the data from the what is a standard curve video. If you want to see that, I'll go ahead and uh, put that link below. We're going to determine the range of the data sets. So you need to look at the data that you have and then look at the space that you have on the graph. So on this particular graph, I've got 21 squares and I'm going to plot the concentration from 0 to 50 uh, just because that is more convenient. So I'm going to consider my range 50 milligrams per deciliter. I've got 20 squares that I want to use. And if I do that division, I get 2.5 milligrams per deciliter per square. So that's what each square represents. Now, I am making a big deal about this, but the truth is, all of you watching this, you would just do this without thinking, okay? You would just naturally figure out what the range is, how many tick marks you want, and you would put the values in like that, right? You, you don't really think about it. The reason why I mention how to do this is because students hate it when the numbers get ugly, as they do in in our absorbance values. So it's the Y that is ugly. I've got 16 squares and I've got to figure out how to graph my absorbance data. Now 0 0.0075 is very, very close to zero. So I'm going to use as a range from zero to 0 0.037 and I've got 16 squares to do that. So what I do is I divide the range by the number of squares that I have. That gives me 0 0.0023, that number is kind of awkward, so I'm going to round up and use 0 0.003 per square. So what I'm going to do is start with the smallest number. In this case, I am using 0, even though that is not one of my data points, but it is very close to 0 0.0075. And then you add the increment that you just decided to use. Now just for clarity, I'm not going to mark every single square on the Y, I'm going to use every other square. So you're going to notice, I'm going to go up, my next point will be 0 0.006. Again, I don't want to clutter the Y, so I don't need to label every single one. Um, I did actually label quite a lot here, just so you guys could see. And I go all the way up to 0 0.042. That extends beyond my data set by a little bit. And that's okay. It's going to look good. Now I'm going to plot the data. So what I do is I look at my data and I take that first point, the 10 on the X, 0 0.0075 on the Y. So I'm going to go up on the X and then I'm going to find 0 0.0075 on the Y and that's where my point goes. And I'm going to do the same thing for the rest of my data points. And ta-da! There you go. Those are my points plotted on the graph. Oftentimes you will be asked to draw a line of best fit. I'm going to do that here and you just need to eyeball it and get a ruler. And Flops the Penguin is here to remind you, don't extrapolate. That means don't take the line beyond your data points, right? You don't know what happens outside of that range. So don't extrapolate the line. Next, I'm going to show you how to measure the slope of a line. So what you need to do is pick two points on the line. And I just picked at random these two. And uh, boy, does this bring back memories. Oh, yes, it does. The slope of a line is simply the rise over the run. That's the easiest way to think about it. It is the change in y divided by the change in x. So you've probably seen it written like this. So for our line right here and the two points I've selected, I'm going to take 3 minus negative 1 divided by 4 minus negative 2. 
And when you do the math, you get four sixths, which is two thirds. And that's the slope. All right, that was a trip down memory lane, right? Uh, the last thing is you want to think about the results, obviously, and discuss them in your results section, in your lab notebook, or in a lab report. All right, we've got some special tips here at the end. Sorry, it's, it's, it's not funny, but I'm, I'm desperate. Um, if you have a datum at the origin, you should graph it. And if you don't, then don't. By the way, the word datum is the singular of data. So that is actually how you use it. Next, what about outliers? What are you going to do with data points that are way out of range compared to everybody else? Um, usually they are due to experimental error or just regular variability. Um, the reality is in research, whether you retain or exclude an outlier depends on statistical tests. My point is you don't get to choose, okay, uh, things like Q tests and so forth are what we use to determine whether or not we keep them. Um, in an educational setting, I would say ask your professor about your outliers. Breaking your axis. So a lot of times you end up in a situation like this where your data set will contain some values that are really, really far away from the rest. And when that happens, the best thing to do is put a break in your axis. And I've shown a couple different ways that we show that. And probably the best way for me to show you why you would want to do this is to show you the same data set expressed with and without the break. So here you see the data set with an axis break. Now I'm going to show you the same set of data, and I do not break the axis. Now you can see that because that series 4 is so out of range compared to the others, um, what basically happens is you don't get to see anything in the other data sets. So this is a great example of when you would want to break your axis. The last thing that we're going to do is talk about percent change, because this is something that many times you will find yourself having to graph. And there is actually a way to calculate percent change. You're going to take the new value minus the original value divided by the absolute value of the original value. Um, sometimes that's called a modulus. And whatever the number is, whether it's negative or positive, you make it positive. That's all an absolute value is. You can think of it as the distance from zero on a graph, okay? And that is going to give you the percent change. And the best way for me to show this is to give you a couple of examples. So here I've got heart rate before and after exercise. So I take my new value minus the original value divided by the absolute value of the original value times 100. And that's going to give me an 81% change. Notice that's an increase. In example number two, my original value is higher than the new value. And I'm pointing this out because it's really important to notice when the value is negative, that means you had a negative percent change. Don't forget the negative. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons below. Like, share, and subscribe. Join me on Facebook. Follow on Twitter. Good luck.